Yes, yeah, sir. Okay, how are things? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, now uh, almost okay. So I think I will give you an update by tomorrow. Okay. Sir, now it's uh, YouTube live. We can start. Okay. Uh, very. Uh, yeah, good afternoon to one and all present here for today's. Okay, uh, can you start recording also? Yes, yes. So. So I welcome uh, all the participants and panelists for today's lecture. So I request uh, Professor Someshwar Das to welcome the panelists as well as the participants of today's lecture. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, <clears throat> uh, Professor Pradeep Kumar, uh, the speaker for today's lecture. Uh, this is third lecture on cloud physics, as you all know. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi Kumar, of course, uh, Dr. Mohan, Dr. Rohini, uh, the today's panel members present. Uh, so we are getting good feedback from most of the people, uh, most of the attendees about all these lectures. And uh, we have a good number of participants who have got 100% attendance also. Many of them have got 100% attendance. And we mentioned uh, earlier itself that uh, those who have got more than 75% attendance, they will be able to also appear in the evaluation test to be conducted at the end of the course. Uh, only one uh, lecture is uh, remaining. So, probably we are planning to have this uh, evaluation test, Dr. Lakshikumar, on 29th? Uh, yes, sir, 29th, uh, Saturday. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So uh, the evaluation test will be conducted on 29th and uh, accordingly, those who perform well, they will be all given the certificates of merits, uh, et cetera. Therefore, uh, please be uh, regular and also try to study all the PowerPoints are being shared already uh, for the past lectures. Uh, so please study those things uh, carefully. All the lectures are also available on the YouTube, as you all know. So please go through the lectures. And then, uh, actually, yeah, the Thank you, sir, has already joined. So thank you. Thank you, sir, Namaskar. Namaskar. So, OK, so now on to you, Dr. Professor Deep Kumar. OK, I will I'll share the screen now. Yeah. Okay. Can be seen now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So today's mechanism lecture is on precipitation mechanisms in cold and mixed phase clouds. Now let me recap uh, what I have my first two lectures. We can divide uh, the cloud processes into warm cloud processes, which is non-freezing, and cold cloud processes where the cloud has crossed the freezing level and where it is, it is freezing processes and the mixed phase processes. And warm cloud processes I have covered till now. So let me recap. Uh, droplet formation by homogeneous nucleation is not favored in a subsaturated air. And in supersaturated air, even for a very small embryonic droplets to form, the supersaturations or the relative humidity required are very, very large and such high supersaturations are not observed in the atmosphere. I've shown you an example that even for a very small embryonic droplet of 0 0.01 micron to form, uh, supersaturations required are something like 112% uh, relative humidity or supersaturation of 12%. And whereas in the atmosphere, you don't see more than 1% to 2% supersaturation. Now, heterogeneous nucleation happens with the aid of uh, CCN, which are uh, hygroscopic aerosols. And I had discussed uh, with this two examples of uh, sodium uh, chloride and ammonium sulfate. And so the dissolved CCN can drastically lower the equilibrium vapor pressure over a droplet. And this 
Lowering of equilibrium vapor pressure over a solution droplet helps in the cloud droplet activation and supersaturations or relative humidity found in natural clouds. And uh, we derive the Kohler equation. So Kohler equation, and I described the Kohler curve of uh, explain to you how the activation happens. So Kohler equation gives the critical radius of the droplet when it is activated as a cloud droplet or the critical supersaturation required for the CCM to activate as a cloud droplet. So after the cloud droplet is activated, the drop begins to grow by condensation of water vapor. And uh, so this process, uh, I said that the growth rate is inversely proportional to the radius of the drop. So therefore, this is a very slow process and to produce rain in a reasonable time. In warm clouds, the growth of droplets from a relatively small size, which uh, happens through the condensation process. And to the size of the raindrops can happen through the process of collection by the collision and coalition mechanisms. And when you do a stochastic modeling, uh, we have seen that the rain can be produced through the stochastic modeling in about 15 minutes. So this was a recap of my first. Now today, let us look at the ice phase. Okay. Now if you look at typical deep convective cloud, uh, Below the freezing level, you have only liquid drops. This is your warm cloud processes. Typically, a cloud is at around 1,000 meters. And between freezing level and minus 38, you have a mixed phase clouds because you get both ice phase as well as liquid drops, which we call it as a super cool drops because they are not frozen because of various uh, reasons which I'll come to later. And above minus 38, you have only ice phase, which we it is a glaciated phase. So this is from freezing level onwards above, we categorize it as a cold cloud process. Now, why ice phase is important in clouds? More than 50% of the mid-latitude precipitation is produced by a cold cloud involving ice. Whereas in tropical region, this is about 30%. Mixed phase clouds are very important in producing rainfall during the monsoon season. I'm illustrating a satellite observation, which is a typical monsoon day situation over uh, the region. And you see that all these, they are all reaching temperatures as low as minus 40, minus 30, minus 20. So the cold phase, this is all the cold phase. Above freezing, it's all cold processes which are dominating. So you see the typical, even in the mon typical monsoon situation, you have a significant amount of rain which is going coming from the cold cloud processes. So, but in situ observations of ice microphysical properties are very few. They are not much because uh, you need to fly in aircraft to take observations. So those are not, uh, much of the observations are not available. So now let us look at the ice nucleating pathways which are available. Homogeneous nucleation can happen below minus 38 degrees Celsius and at very high supersaturation with respect to ice. And between zero and minus 38, it is the heterogeneous nucleation which is important. The process which happens and for heterogeneous nucleation, a foreign particle is required, which we call it as the ice nucleating particle. Now, ice nucleating particle is material, substance, object, item, unit or other that is assumed to be the agent responsible for the observed heterogeneous nucleation process. Now, there are four different modes of heterogeneous nucleation. The deposition nucleation, where water vapor condenses on an ice nucleating particle and forms an ice nuclei. So this is my ice nucleating particle. And when temperature and supersaturation are right, water vapor can condense on them, begin to condense on them, and then it can form an ice crystal. Then the next is an immersion freezing nuclei. That is the, ion, the ice nucleating particle, which is already present in a cloud droplet, can initiate the freezing when the temperature is right for its activation. So this is, there is already ice nucleating particle inside the droplet 
and when sufficient cooling has happened, the crystallized can start forming the crystal from inside, and finally, a nice crystal is formed. The next is the condensation freezing process. Now, condensation freezing process, the the supersaturation or uh, the relative humidity has to be higher than 100% because this first this, it will it'll act as a CCN first, where that water vapor can condense and form a droplet when the relative humidity is right. And then, so it is again embedded inside. And then when the temperature is right, it can start forming an ice crystal and you can get an ice crystal. So now these two processes are generally, uh, it is very difficult to separate. So immersion freezing and condensation freezing process are generally termed together. And the last process is the contact freezing. Contact freezing is when the a droplet is there and when it comes in contact with the ice nucleating particle, it can initiate the freezing from externally. So a ice nucleating particle comes in contact with the droplet and the freezing can be initiated and you can get an ice crystal. So these are the four different modes of heterogeneous nucleation. Now ice crystals can take a variety of uh, shapes in the atmosphere okay so based on the temperature we have some uh, basic habits now the basic habit will be either plate like habits or prism like habits and the shapes it can take with very slight variation in the water saturation at those temperatures now at zero to minus four you can have plate like which is thin hexagonal plates so this is a plate Okay, and at minus four to minus ten, it is prism-like. You can have needles from minus four to minus six. This is a needles. It's not a very good picture. And you have hollow columns. These are the columns, hollow columns, or minus ten to minus twenty-two. Twenty-two. That can take a variety of shapes here, because minus ten to minus twelve, you can get sector plates. So these are the shapes of different sector plates. And between 12 to minus 16, you can have dendrites, wherein you have a lot of uh, uh, growth happening. And these crystals can grow very big. So these are the dendrites. And again, uh, minus 16 to minus 22, we can again have sector plates. And between minus 22 to minus 50, you can have hollow columns or you can have plates. So these are the basic habits, plate-like or prism-like. And with various slight water saturation, you can have these plates. Now, these photographs, which are here on this from top to bottom, these are the photographs which are taken from my laboratory. And these photographs were provided to me by my student, Saurabh Patil, who is presently doing his PhD at Sevier Storms Laboratory, Oklahoma. Now, ice crystal, this is a, a, a big slight saturation, variation in the supersaturation with respect to ice, the, how the shapes can vary. So at between around minus 10 to minus 20, you, you get ice crystals which are really growing very big. So these are the different shapes and this is the water saturation line. That is where the 100% relative humidity with respect to water. And this is the ice saturation. So now once an ice particle is formed in the cloud, it has to grow further. Now further growth can take place through several processes, through a few processes. First is an aggregation of ice particles. Aggregation is where they can collide and stick together. Provided their fall speeds are different, they can collide, they can stick together with one another. And this is a process through which a snow can form. Snow can form through the aggregation process where they can, different ice crystals of different shapes can stick together and fall down. Okay, this is again from my, my work, which is published in Weather 1989. Okay. Now, the next process is an accretion process. An accretion process is where you have in a mixed phase cloud, you have super cold droplets as well as ice crystals, both are present. And 
So when a supercooled droplet hits, collides with an ice crystal, it can freeze. So this is a frozen drop on an ice crystal. Okay. And that process of the supercooled droplet colliding on the ice crystal and freezing is called as a rhyming process. And these photographs below are the photographs of rhymed crystal. Okay, these are from the actual atmosphere. This is the picture from my lab. And this is provided by my former students or a party from the CVS Tom's laboratory, Oklahoma. So this is a rhyme crystal where a lot of supercool droplets have collided on it and, and frozen. So the drops collide on these ice crystals so we, and they freeze. So that is called as a rhymed crystal. So, so you have got a pristine crystal, you have got a rhyme crystal. And when rhyming has crossed a stage where you can no longer tell what is the sh was the shape of the original ice crystal, then it is called as a graupel. Now this is this is again from an actual picture taken falling on the ground. Okay, this was uh, again taken in US at Sibir Storms Laboratory, where from my former student. Now this is an ice crystal, pristine ice crystal. This is a rhymed crystal. And these are all graupel. Okay. So where you can no longer say this, you can say this is a rhymed crystal. But here you can no longer say what was the shape of the original crystal. Then you say it is a rhymed crystal. Then you say it is a graupel. Okay. And then extreme growth of an graupel is a hail. So hail normally grows in very severe convective storms. And if you can look at this hail, uh, very carefully. This is again hail which has been uh, collected by my student and uh, photographed individually. Now if you look at this hail, you can see light color shading and then dark color shading. Now what happens is the process is that is it is a graupel on which supercool droplets are colliding and they are freezing. So when the freezing is happening, the latent heat is getting released. So when the latent heat is getting released, it will begin to start growing wet. And then at again, at some point of time, it would have uh, cooled down. So it will again start to grow dry. So by looking, actually, if you can, sometimes if you don't see it, you can cut it and then see how the shapes, how the color shade is varying inside. And then you can see whether the growth of the, up, uh, up to what diameter the growth of the, hail was wet up to and from after that how much the dry growth was there this can you can study that now hail can cause extensive damage because unlike uh, snow because snow is a collection of ice crystals so its fall velocity is very very small very very less but hail the velocity is very very high so it can damage it can cause extensive damage and these are these are small hail because it's only a size of a, a coin okay but Hail as, as big as tennis balls can occur inside a very uh, severe convective storms. So once, so you can look at uh, the growth of uh, ice crystal by vapor deposition. Now the amount of water vapor in a cloudy air with respect to uh, liquid water will not produce a supersaturation in excess of 1%. So you can Maximum expect around 101% relative humidity with respect to liquid water inside a cloud. But however, if you take a 1% supersaturation with respect to liquid water at the same temperature at minus 10 degrees Celsius, if you are taking at 1% supersaturation at minus 10 degrees Celsius, then it will be supersaturated with respect to ice by about 10%. And if it's 1% supersaturation with respect to liquid water at minus 20, then it will be with respect to ice, it will be 21% supersaturated. So consequently, the growth of ice particles from vapor phase in the cloud will be much faster than the growth of liquid droplets by condensation <laughs> process. So this has got an implication. The implication, if you look at the, I have plotted here the saturated vapor pressure both respect with respect to water and with respect to ice and uh, this you can plot it using your clausius clapeyron equation because i've 
dealt with Clausius Clapeyron equation, which you can look back into your notes. So, with respect to water, you just uh, substitute the latent heat of vaporization, and with if you want it with respect to ice, ice in that equation, you sub substitute instead of latent heat of vaporization, you substitute the latent heat of sublimation. Then you will get the saturation vapor pressure with respect to ice. So, if you look at it, the saturation vapor pressure with respect to water is always higher. So, which means over the droplet, it will be much higher compared to the ice. So, therefore, at the same freezing temperatures, at this, this is all at sub-zero temperatures. Okay. So, over the water droplet, it will be higher as compared to the ice. So, due to this difference in the saturation water vapor pressure between liquid water and ice, the ice crystal would gain mass by vapor deposition at the expense of the liquid drop that would lose mass by evaporation. So, because over the water droplet, the saturation vapor pressure is higher as compared to ice. So, in a mixed place clouds, when both are existing together, the droplets will begin to evaporate. And that vapor is, will be gained by the ice crystal and ice will grow at the expense of water droplets. This process is called as the wegener berger and Findensen process, more popularly known as the berger and Findensen process. So, this has a uh, lot of implication in how the precipitation particles grow in a mixed phase cloud. In a mixed phase cloud, it is ice will be growing at the expense of water droplets. Now, if you want to look at the growth rate of ice crystals, when an ice crystal is growing from the vapor phase, the rate of growth of an ice crystal is controlled by the surface kinetics, by the rate of diffusion of water vapor through the air, and by the rate at which the latent heat of deposition can be dispersed from the surface of the ice crystal. So, these following factors contribute to the growth rate of ice crystal and I am not going through the derivation, but I will give you the final form of the, the growth rate equation where the dm by dt, which is the growth rate of ice crystal, is takes this following form where C is the capacitance equivalent of a crystal shape because crystals come in all kinds of shape. So, a capacitance equivalent of a crystal shape is taken and D is the water vapor diffusion coefficient. Rho infinity is the water vapor density away from the ice crystal and rho c is the water vapor density adjacent to the ice crystal. So, this equation determines the growth rate by the vapor diffusion. Now, using the clausius clapeyron equation, we can get the growth rate of ice crystal as dm by dt 4 pi c g s i, where s i is the supersaturation with respect to ice and g is all these remaining parameters put together. So, where the product now from this clausius clapeyron equation, I have calculated the product of g i s i and g i s i is the product which reaches maximum around minus 14 degrees Celsius. So, the maximum growth rate of ice crystals growing by vapor deposition is seen around minus 12 to minus 15. So, that is the uh, temperature range where if the supersaturation is very high, you have the dendrite type crystals growing. Because from the lab experiments, I know that is growing a dendrite is very, very difficult because we have to maintain a very high supersaturation at these temperatures. So, at, for a, at very high supersaturations between minus 10 to minus 15, we can grow, get the dendritical growth of the ice crystals. Now, for an ice crystal to form, you need that is the, we have the four heterogeneous mode of nucleation. So, heterogeneous mode of nucleation, you require an ice nucleating particle, which can operate through four different modes of nucleation. Now, what are the structure and the properties of ice nucleation? particle. Now, the crystal structure, because these are basically aerosol particles which are there in the atmosphere. Okay, So, the crystal structure of the aerosol particle is very important for water molecule to form an ice lattice on the particle. So, basically the crystal structure of your ice nucleating particle should have a close match with the ice crystal structure. So, the lattice structure should be the same, similar to an ice crystal. So, that is the most important criteria for any aerosol particle to act as an ice nucleating particle. Now, ice nucleating particles in general are water insoluble and solid surfaces, they provide an ice site for ice nucleation to begin. 
Condensation of water molecules on rigid surfaces allows an ice embryo to reach a critical radius with smaller number of water molecules, whereas the soluble ones get disintegrated under the action of water and prevent ice nucleation. So that is why it requires a solid particle for a ice nucleation to happen. Now the surface area of an aerosol and the number of active sites per unit area are very important for the aerosol particle to act as an ice nucleating particle, especially for deposition mode ice nucleation. Now what are these active sites? Active sites are imperfection on surface of ice nucleating particle, such as cracks, pores and steps. And the number of active sites required for ice nucleation are not enough in small particles, in smaller aerosol particles. Hence, aerosol particles less than 0.5 micron are not efficient as ice nucleating particle. However, there are biological aerosols in the atmosphere which can activate as an ice nuclei. And biological aerosols are of the size less than 0.2 micron can be active as ice nucleation particle in the immersion freezing mode. Now, what are the main groups of ice nucleating particles? The first main is the mineral dust. There are several of them in that. That is the calonite, common clay minerals. These are all common clay minerals which are there. Desert dust is one of the major contributions throughout the world for these ice nucleating particles. 90% of the particles that act as ice nucleating particle during Saharan dust episodes are silicates or calcium carbonates. And they are one of the best ice nucleating particles in the, in the atmosphere because sometimes you have ice nucleating, even ice uh, fog events happening in the Arctic as far away as Arctic. And the source of it is the Saharan dust which is blown there. Okay, so these are carried by the winds and you can find them globally, they spread. Stoot. Stoot is another ice nucleating particle because these are impure carbon particles resulting from the incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons. Then biological aerosols, including some, some bacteria, they are very efficient ice nucleating particles. So therefore, there is uh, ice nucleation. There is, apart from our cloud physics community, the community on the food preservation, there is a lot of which that is you put food into the freezer and this one. So there is a lot of interest on the biological aerosols from the food community, that is the food preservation community, food technology community. Okay. Then solid ammonium sulfate at temperatures of cirrus clouds. Then there are again various organic acids which are naturally produced by trees, which can activate as ice nuclei. And then there are others like silver iodide. This is a patented one because silver iodide is the one which is used for artificial rain, artificial rain making process for cold clouds. And this was patented sometime in 1947 by Vonnegut. Now, what are the different techniques for detecting the ice nucleating particle in the atmosphere? The first in the 90s, 1940s and the 1950s, the expansion cloud chamber was developed. Then in the 1960s and the 70s, thermal gradient diffusion chamber was developed where you collect aerosols on filter paper and you can process it in a thermal gradient diffusion chamber. And generally two modes of uh, nucleation can, nuclei can be measured. That is the deposition mode nuclei and the condensation freezing mode nuclei. In the 1970s, diffusion and settling cloud chambers were developed for use in aircraft where supersaturation is controlled by injecting cloud condensation nuclei. Then in the mid 1970s, continuous flow diffusion chamber was invented because that is thermal gradient diffusion chamber. You could collect filters, but continuous flow diffusion chambers, you can take it out in the field and immediately you will get your ice nuclei count. But whereas in uh, uh, thermal gradient diffusion chamber, you had to wait till you, your filter paper you are collecting and bringing it back to the lab for processing. So this followed a cylindrical design for nearly 20 years. 
and then later a parallel plate geometry that is vertical or horizontal from the mid uh, mid to, uh, 2000s now this has an inability to measure the contact freezing mode due to the less sampling time which the ice nucleus spends in this chamber about 1 to 2 liter per minute then from 2008 onwards the continuous flow mixing chambers came this permits a higher sampling volume because in these ones you could only sample about 1 to 2 liters per minute of the air but whereas here you could sample up to about 10 liters per minute and here supersaturation is creating created by mixing aerosol stream with warm humid cold air and then in 2009 an electrodynamic balance was uh, designed for contact freezing so this is the timeline of the development of different detecting detection techniques for ice nucleating particles that were developed now this is an expansion chamber this is the very first one which came which was developed by big 1957 where in a cloud chamber a sample of air is suddenly cooled by expansion to create the supersaturation so this is a similar process as a cloud as the cloud is expanding Uh, as rising it expands because it is going to the lower pressure and then as it is expanding its uh, supersaturation lowers so the same similar process is this one and then when the particle the aerosol particles which are there they would if they would freeze uh, they would form the ice crystals the ice crystals will fall and that ice crystal will fall onto a a glycol water mixture here and on that they can count and the number of ice crystals which are there is equal to the number of ice nucleating particles so this is the uh, this one uh, the at various temperatures again if you can see the number of ice nucleating particles even at minus 25 it could not reach more than 10 ice nucleating particle per liter of air so if i draw an analogy to ccn ccn is of the order of 10 to the power of 6 per liter but whereas here you are getting a few per liter of ice nucleating particle so that is the main reason why your super cool droplets exist in the mixed phase clouds because for heterogeneous nucleation to happen ice nucleating particles should be there and they are not enough in number so that is why mixed phase clouds exist till minus 38 after below which the homogeneous nucleation can happen and the droplets can freeze by the homogeneous nucleation process the bigger drops will start freezing by around minus 38 and the very very small ones by minus 40 they would have frozen so this is the measurement again the thermal gradient diffusion chamber which we have developed in our laboratory here which we have uh, used it for lot of field observations now how this functions is you have two plates here wherein we form ice layer we put the we pour water onto it and then we freeze it so this is operated inside a cold room and so these are the two plates and in the center of the plate we have put a mesh where we put the filter which we exposes to the we on which we collect the aerosol particles in field field experiment field uh, campaigns and then these two plate uh, ice layers are kept at different temperatures the bottom one is kept at a colder temperature and the top one is kept at slightly warmer temperature again from the the temperature will be linearly varying so again uh, with glaciers uh, clapeyron equation you can find out the supersaturation which is exerted by the this one and this supersaturation is with respect to ice because it is with respect to ice layer so that will be somewhere closer to the colder surface so now you can bring in the you can collect your filters in the field you can bring it back to the lab and then you can analyze it in the lab and in the lab i'm i'm giving you different curves this is my 100% relate to humidity with respect to water and these are my saturation lines with respect to ice 15% super saturated with respect to ice this is a temperature so at minus 10 if if i am here then this is my super saturation with respect to water this is 15% super saturated to ice this is 25 20% super saturated to ice and 25% super saturated to ice so 
I can vary this one, the temperature, and then I can open the uh, uh, chamber and then I can count the activated filter. This is a processed filter, hydrophobic. The filter has to be hydrophobic filter because we don't want water to be uh, on this ice, uh, filter. So these are all the ice crystals which are there. You count the ice crystals and that will give you the number of ice nucleating particles. So then you can operate this in two different modes. So in each mode you can count and you can get the number of ice nucleating particles in different modes. So this is how this, uh, you need not carry a bulky equipment to the field. You only need to take some small cartridges, collect your filter paper and bring it back. And this is again, uh, at the University of Toronto, this is uh, the, the parallel plate geometry of a continuous flow diffusion chamber and a continuous flow diffusion chamber. This is a design similar to the CCN chamber, which I had developed at University of Toronto. This is a paper which is there, which I described it in the CCN measurements. So the same design is being followed here. Only thing is, instead of filter papers with water, it is a ice. It is a with respect to ice so that the saturation you are getting inside is with respect to ice. So again, you bring in the outside air, squeeze it to the center and you have a dry nitrogen sheath flow, which is coming at very high speed so that the aerosol particles are seeing the center of the chamber. And by the time it, it exits out of the chamber, what if there are INPs would have activated and you will get ice crystals. So you can count the number of ice crystals and that would be equal to the number of ice nucleating particles which are activated as an ice crystal at the given supersaturation and given temperature. Now this is a design of a continuous flow diffusion chamber which is a cylindrical type. Again, these have been used for several field experiments. Now this is uh, this one where this because uh, it removes the large particle sizes are removed and you have got an, these are cylindrical in shape. So you have got one cylinder of ice and in between there is a space for the you to push the aerosols in. And this is again the outer ice layer. So you keep the inner ice layer at minus 36, outer ice layer at minus 20. So you've got a supersaturation building in the chamber, which is, will be close to maximum where you are pushing in your aerosols. Again, you have got sheet air, which you are sending in at very high speed and you're squeezing your aerosols in between. And when they would have come out, they would have, again, if all the ice nucleating particles, which can be activated at that, whatever is a given supersaturation you have adjusted to, they would have activated and you can count the ice crystals. And so an optical particle counter is kept and you can count the ice crystals and the ice crystals is equal to the number of ice nucleating particles. So these again, this, these uh, CFDCs have been used for field experiments, carrying out observations in this. Again, again, for an immersion freezing mode, immersion freezing mode is again, uh, your ice nucleating particle will be in the droplet. So first what you do is you send your aerosol particles and your first try to activate it as a CCN so that the droplets are formed and then you supercool it. And then you, if these, these particles are immersion freezing type of nuclei, that is the condensation freezing or the immersion freezing, then they can initiate the ice nucleation process. And some of them will be droplets, those which have not, those nuclei which are not uh, immersion freezing type but those which are immersion freezing type crystals would have formed and you can count the crystals through an optical detector. Then the bio aerosols, you can bio aerosols are usually done in the oil mode because you use an oil, these are cryocells are used and you can uh, collect again the particles on the filter and bring it and then put it into the this one. So these are pollen samples are measured in oil immersion mode where small droplets were dispersed in an oil matrix. So again, this is nucleation rate versus temperature without pollens, which are the blue dots and with pollens, which are the red dots. So with pollens, they can activate at a much 
higher temperatures. Now, this is an overview of the ice nucleation onset temperatures and saturation ratio. Saturation ratio is here and uh, temperature is here. This is a collection of all the lab results. This is a good review paper here. So you can see that at different temperatures, various modes of activation, which has happened here. The, the important take home uh, point to be noted here is that bio aerosols can nucleate at a very, at lower ice supersaturation and at a higher temperatures. So this is very, very important because generally in a cloud, uh, between zero and minus uh, five degrees Celsius, the supercool droplets are more in number. Almost 90% of the uh, precipitation particles between zero and minus five are supercool droplets. So this is where your bio aerosols play an important role. And supercool droplets are very dangerous for aircrafts because when an aircraft flies in through it, it is a cold body on which these droplets can freeze and it can affect the aerodynamic stability because the aircraft body, when it is cold, it is kind of a, providing a surface for a contact nucleation to happen. So when droplets are freezing, they are all freezing on the aircraft body when they hit a cold body. So it's a contact nucleation which is happening. So, the, so super cold droplets are therefore very harmful. So now I'll give you the field observation. This is the aircraft observations, which is which have been done over the Indian region during the cloud air, cloud aerosol interaction precipitation enhancement experiments, SkyPEX. So here in the phase one, which happened during 2009 to 11, uh, this was conducted by the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology located at Pune, India. And aerosol samples were collected on hydrophobic filters, which are flown on the aircraft during the CAPEX phase one. So 90 samples were collected from these five regions. The regions are given here. And another 50 samples were collected in 2010 and 11, 90 during June to September 2009. The minimum altitude of sample collection was 220 meters and the maximum altitude of sample collection was about seven kilometers. So between this altitude range, the aerosol particles were collected. They were brought into the my lab in the here in the university and we had processed and the ice nucleating particles were counted. And also we did the chemical analysis to find out what kind of minerals they had. Now, if you look at it, uh, this figure here, the maximum ice number of ice crystal, ice nucleating particle we could get was only five per liter. And that too, mostly it was in the range zero. If you look at these, mostly the red dots are the orange dots dominate, which are generally in the range of less than one per liter of air. So that is one of the main reasons why your super cold droplets are dominating in the mixed phase clouds. So it, only as the temperature goes lower and lower, the ice, ice nucleating particles become efficient and it starts freezing. So when you look at this the different, uh, so these filters were analyzed to look at what are the, using a semi-EDX and uh, to find out what are the particles. So these are all the uh, minerals which are there, magnesium, copper, zinc, ferrous, aluminum, sodium, indium, then uh, vanadium. So this is again a published work in 2014 by Patadi et al, was our PhD student. And now, see, when you fly an aircraft, your sampling time is very less. You just fly, sample only for about 30 seconds or maximum a minute. And you're, you're moving very fast. And generally a sortie doesn't go for more than 40 minutes or something, 40 to 50 minutes. So you're not getting so many samples. So what people globally do is they uh, try to go and sit on mountain tops so that you get a continuous measurements going on. So we also did the same thing here. We went on campaign modes for a week at a stretch sitting on tops of small hills. So this is again at Uti, uh, a place in India, again at two, two kilometers altitude and uh, close by Pune, again at uh, a kilometer altitude. So we collect the filters, we, we collect the samples throughout the day. 24 hours, we collect the sample continuously for a week. These were all the campaign dates which are given. And we also measured the aerosol simultaneously. So the activation factor is only one Q 
here if you look at it, they are typically about one ice nucleating particle in 10 to the power of 5 or 10 to the power of 6 numbers of aerosol. So it is low if you look at the activation factor fraction. And in a liter of air, we could, we could get maximum only 1.6 per liter of air. And this is the temperature range at which we operated our chamber. And this is the supersaturation 5% to 23% with respect to ice where the activation is happened. And these are all the kind of minerals which are there. And here we have gotten higher activation fat fraction because there were a lot of rare earth minerals we observed on that particular campaign. And rare earth minerals, there are work by Japanese scientists that they are very good ice nuclei. Again, this is again a published work. This is the reference for that. Now, if I look at the globally, if I look at the results, uh, here I have given our results, which was from the CAPEX campaign, maximum 5 liter, 5 per liter, starting from 0.2. This is again big Australia, 0.1 per liter. Okay, at minus 20, at minus 10, it was still about two orders less. This is again Mayers. Mayers is uh, done at different locations. These are basically from a US desert, Texas, and uh, this one. This is again, you could get go up to 13 per liter at minus 20. Then again at Colorado, maximum 10 per liter, but then again at, it is at minus 50. At minus 10, it could you could get only one per liter. And this is again in the Western USA, again one per liter at around minus 15 to 10 per liter at minus 50. In Alaska, on an average, they could get one per liter. And in mid Pacific at minus 32, remain, remember this is your reaching almost the, uh, the homogeneous freezing level temperature. They could get up to 40 per liter. Antarctica, again, it is very low, maximum only 10 per liter. Again, one more result in Antarctica where they have again gone to very low temperature, minus 27, they could get 53 per liter. Then Argentina, about one per liter, and China, about close to 0.9 or one per liter. So if you look and look at these results globally, the ice nucleating Particles are very, very small in number on an average, one per part liter of air. Whereas CCN you are getting is about 10 to the power of six. But there is a, a mismatch. The mismatch is when you look at the observed ice particle concentration in the clouds, they are about 10 to the power of three more than an INP. So, what could be happening is the question, this one. So, that means there must be a secondary production mechanism, which is an ice multiplication process which must exist in the clouds to see this number going up by more, around 1,000 more than your ice nucleating particle. So, ice particles in the cloud are more. So, Historically, the first mechanism proposed was droplet fragmentation during freezing process. So when an ice crystal is freezing, they can fracture and then there can be so many other. So when a fracture means so many multiple particles are ice particles are put into the cloud, again on which the, it can grow by the vapor, vapor deposition. And so therefore, your number of particles are more compared to your ice nucleating particles. The another process, multiplication process, is the hallett mosser process, which is mostly invoked in the numerical models, uh, numerical cloud models when they run it. Here, splinter formation during, a, during rhyming under a very selective process. Now, rhyming is a process wherein your supercooled droplets are colliding on an ice crystal and freezing. So, a cloud, and it should have an, a particular size of droplet spectrum. It, it cannot be smaller than 13 micron and greater than 25 micron. And this is the experimental results of Hallett and Mossop. Uh, different impact velocities, they have done it. And so this has got a temperature range around minus three to minus eight, where this system can, where this process can be function operative. Wherein during the collision of supercooled droplets with ice crystals, the ice multiplication can happen. So if you look at the ion, ice nucleating particle and ice particle observations from a field, field campaigns, 
So this is INP particles, ice nucleating particles, which are 10 to the power of minus 4 per liter at minus 5 and 10 to the power of minus 1 per liter at minus 20. This was in a campaign mode. And at the same time, the ice particle concentrations observed was 500 per liter at around minus 15 degrees Celsius. So you look at this, these numbers, 10 to the point, this is 0 0.1 per liter at minus 20. But at the same time, you are at around minus 15, you are getting the observation was 500 per liter. Hallett Mosser mechanism may not be always be operative in a narrow range of temperature because it is it's operative only between minus 3 to minus 8 degrees Celsius. So, therefore, other secondary ice formation must exist, process must be there to explain the observed ice particle concentration compared to the ice nucleating particles. So, these are the secondary ice nucleation, ice production mechanisms. So, Ice nucleating particles are rare in the atmosphere, about uh, on an average one per liter or even less. But observed ice particle concentration are 10 to the power of three more than an INP particle. So different secondary ice production mechanism. One could be the droplet fragmentation during freezing. During freezing, we all know from our common experience in a in, when you try to freeze your water in the uh, in a, in your refrigerator. After some time, you put water and you remove it, you will see that the ice has started forming from the outside. The inside is still liquid. So here also, inside is liquid, but when inside freezes, the drop metal droplet will fragment. As because when the water freezes, it expands. So the outer shell will break, giving you a lot of fragments of ice crystals on which again vapor deposition can happen and it can grow as an ice particles. This is again the halite mosser process where a splintering is happening during the rhyming when the supercool droplets are colliding on ice crystals and they are uh, during that rhyming process, this can fragment. Then fragmentation during ice ice collision, when two ice crystals are colliding, it can fragment and you can produce again further number of smaller ice particles. Then ice fragmentation during thermal shock. So when a droplet is just colliding and due to the difference in temperature, the crystal can again fragment. And during a sublimation process, it can again break up into small ice particles. So in most of the cloud models, numerical cloud modeling or numer when they are doing numerical weather prediction models, these secondary ice product processes are neglected. And this could be the reason, one of the reason why the number of ice number concentration is, is underestimated in numerical models. Now, from the laboratory, the, from the field experiments, when you run into the, you, the numerical models, the ice nuclear activation in numerical models can be run in different uh, uh, parameterization modes. So one is a temperature dependent. This is a form which the temperature dependent, which was originally given by Fletcher in 1962. So this was the very first parameterization model given for the numerical weather forecasting. Then came uh, super dependence on supersaturation with respect to ice, where yes, SI is the supersaturation with respect to ice, and this was given by Mayers. And then with respect to both temperature and ice supersaturation, this is again, this is the form which is given, cotton et al. Then with the aerosol number concentration and temperature, because I have shown you from our own field experiments how many aerosols are activating as ice nucleating particle, which is again ranging from one per 10 to the power of 6 to 10 to the power of 4 or 10 to the power of 3. So this is again your N aerosol is that is greater than 0.5 micron aerosol size. So your aerosol number concentration is coming. So this is with respect to temperature. And this is our CAPEX observation over the Indian region where our student, uh, my student Dr. Dr. Patade in his PhD thesis, he has done the numerical modeling using this fit from our CAPEX observation. So these are various representation of ice nucleation of the activation, which can be used in numerical models. Now I'll come to the different precipitation mechanisms. 
uh, you have water vapor, which is the starting point, which is, you have your CCN here, water vapor condensing onto CCN, CCN activating and forming droplets. So you get your cloud liquid water con content. Okay. So that is a condensation mode and cloud liquid water content can, cloud liquid drops can again evaporate and can give you back water vapor. So this is a process which is goes this way or that. Cloud liquid water content can convert through collection process to rain. Water vapor can condense again on those raindrops because once the rain has stopped, started form, uh, forming, that doesn't mean the condensation process has stopped. Condensation process also will continue. So water vapor will be condensing at the same time, evaporation can also happen. Again, this is a two-way process. Then, then you have your ice nucleating particle here. Water vapor can condense onto your ice nucleating particle and it can form ice in the cloud. Okay. And again, this is a two-way process because when water vapor is uh, forming ice crystal, that is a deposition process, then the ice can evaporate or that is called as a sublimation process. So this is again, again, from sublimation, you get again water vapor. So it's a two-way process. Then you have your ice multiplication process by which again the cloud ice can increase. Now, cloud ice can again get converted to cloud liquid water through the melting process. Cloud ice can get converted to rain again through collection because rain itself can collect or it can collect go through the melting process. Cloud ice through the aggregation process or the convert can be converted to snow. And again, water vapor can deposit onto the snow and through the deposition process also the snow can grow. And the same time snow can also be evaporating and it can be sublimating. Okay. And giving you water vapor. Snow can again melt and give you rain. Snow can through the collection process can become graupel or hail. Cloud droplets through the rhyming process can again contribute to the hail. It is getting converted to hail. Water vapor through deposition again can contribute to the hail. And hail can again, hail or graupel can sublimate and give you to water vapor. So finally, these are the precipitation fallout. Rain can come down as precipitation. Rain can be mixed with graupel or hail and you can have snow. Now, these are the, all these processes are the important processes in the precipitation mechanism in the formation of a mixed phase cloud. And when you're running any model, all these have to be taken into account. And in addition, I have missed out, you have to also consider the wegener bergeron Findensen process. So the whole numerical modeling of a cloud system is complex because so many interactions, because these are all different interactions which are happening, which have all got to be modeled in order for you to finally come out with the precipitation follow. All your starting point is your water vapor, which you are ending up in precipitation follow. So my take home message from my today's lecture, super cold droplets exist in clouds till minus 38 degrees Celsius below which homogeneous freezing occurs. There are four modes of heterogeneous freezing for which an ice nucleating particle is required. Ice crystals can take a variety of shapes depending on temperature and supersaturation with respect to ice. Your ice crystals can grow either by aggregation process, which is a process which can lead to the formation of snow. Snow can also happen through the, the water vapor uh, depositing and growing into bigger flakes or by accretion of super cold droplets, which can lead to the formation of hail. So 
the main reason why hail is forming is the super cold droplets which are existing in the cloud and super cold droplets are existing in the cloud because of the less number of ice nucleating particles which are there so if you want to suppress an hail you should therefore reduce the super cold droplets in the cloud which means you have to artificially give ice nucleating particles into the cloud so in a mixed phase cloud growth of ice is faster as compared to liquid droplets because of the difference in the uh, e equilibrium vapor pressure over a droplet and over an ice over a droplet it is higher as compared to the ice so ice will be growing faster as compared to liquid droplets in a mixed phase cloud and berger and findensen mechanism states that in a mixed phase cloud ice grows at the expense of water droplets because smaller water droplets would when they are both present together when an ice crystal and uh, droplets are present together the smaller droplets would evaporate and that would provide the water vapor for the ice crystals to grow so, so this is the berger and wegener berger and findensen mechanism so ice nucleating particles are far less in number as compared to the observed ice particle concentration inside in the cloud and therefore secondary ice production mechanisms or the ice multiplication process must exist in the clouds to explain the observed number of ice particle concentrations as compared as compared to the ice nucleating particles which are there so these are the two references, atmospheric science, again, Wallace and Hobbes. And this is a paper which was published uh, last year in Wymondel. I have given a very good review of ice nucleation in clouds. You can go through that. So when I'll continue in the, my, with the electricity and electrification in my next lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Um, now we can take some uh, question and answers. I request uh, Rohini and uh, Mohan to take up the question and answers session. Thank you, sir. Very well, comment first. Uh, thank you, Professor, for very clear presentation. So, the your presentation is very clear. The images and all, it was very. Rohini, your voice is. Uh... Not clear, it is very low volume. Now, can you hear, sir? A little better. Okay, so uh, there is a comment first from a uh, participant that thank you, professor, for very clear presentation. So, he liked the presentation. I, I think he enjoyed the images also, which were shown with that. So, thank you, sir. Uh, one question which has come is what is the difference between rain and precipitation? Rain is when you look at the liquid drops, you call it as the rain. Precipitation can be rain, hail, grapple, snow, everything put together. Okay. Okay. I think uh, they are still writing. I can't hear, Roini. We will wait for a minute, sir. There was one question and one comment, so we will wait for Okay. Sir, what a small query. Uh, in the numerical model, there is a microphysical schemes. So some schemes are like single moment schemes, some schemes are like, uh, like double moment scheme. And all those things are very much related to the uh, snow, gravel, uh, yeah. ice. All those things. Yeah, so that is yeah. uh, what what exactly you are considering, depending upon that. Double moment and scheme will again consider everything. What are what are the because uh, you are you are uh, splitting it into pristine ice, you are splitting it into snow, you are splitting it into graupel, you are splitting it into hail. So even in the ice phase, you have got four different types already coming in. So that is why this, uh, the schemes are very important. So mostly if you want to look for a, a, a very good uh, analysis, then you go for a double moment scheme. Sir, I have got a question to my mobile. I think somebody is... They are asking, what are the cloud measurements that are being taken in India? 
It's only in the campaign mode, the cloud measurements. That was uh, in the Kypex. You don't take on, go on a daily mode. It's a very expensive affair. So, uh, you can, whatever are done are from the ground base. Okay, ground base, uh, you don't get much information except for the cloud base. Cloud base types is the only one which you can get with uh, remote sensing techniques. Or uh, the satellite gives you the um, uh, the cloud uh, droplet effective radius or the ice, uh, this one radius and uh, the satellite measurements. Again, you can get the partitioning between the ice and the cloud and the droplets. So those you can get from the satellite observations. So cloud, unless your radio sound ascent is, is passing through a cloud, you don't get any observations. If it has gone through a cloud, then you will get uh, observations related to temperature, relative humidity, all those things from through the cloud. But other than these uh, particle size measurements, imaging, all those things, microphysics, which are required, uh, those have to be done only on the campaign. Aircraft is required for that. I have one uh, question from my side, just uh, I'm curious to know. Uh, when this uh, wet scavenging is... I didn't get your, this one, I think your, your audio is stopped. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear can... me, sir, no? No, I, I can hear you. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. When wet scavenging of aerosols is happening in the atmosphere, uh -huh. how do you know that, how do you separate whether it is, is in cloud scavenging or uh, below cloud scavenging? That will be difficult. Any, to that will be very difficult to separate because in cloud, of course, you don't. Uh, you'll have to separate again from your long-term observations. Typically, you know the aerosols which are there. So I don't. I don't know exactly no, how. Particularly, if you if you see this, uh, uh, if you take black carbon aerosols, black carbon aerosol, you can find it out. Tell, uh, we, can say they are mostly they are mostly below below they are mostly below. hello sir i think the oh lakshmiji available now ah. lakshmiji recording has stopped somehow no it has started it says Sir, I think there is a, some uh, internet issue in Lakshmi's side. Yeah, uh, my connection. Uh, Lakshmiji, I think uh, you tried to say yeah. something. Maybe oh. we are not Mohan, hearing can you, that. Mohan, Mohan, can you hear me? Yeah, now I hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just I was asking that question only. Uh, is there any mechanism uh, to identify which is in cloud scavenging? No, 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 no. Uh, as far as I think, I don't. I have not worked on scavenging. scavenging. I, I really don't know. Okay, okay. thank you. So it seems there are no other questions. Yeah. Let me see, please. No, no, no. I, I just wanted to. So there, there were no questions. If you have any question, you can ask. Okay. Now, the lecture is really interesting. And as, as per you already showed many expensive instruments. So it is, it is assumed that high level uh, physical phenomena analysis and studies really expensive procedure. Maybe yeah, yeah. many countries it is not possible. Yeah, it's an expensive pro pro process. Yeah. There are two more questions. So, Dr. Mohan, can you read it for uh, uh, Rohini, please? Can you read the questions? I am having problem with my microphone. So, 
uh, no already we discuss uh, many questions actually lakshmi ji already asked two oh, three questions there are two questions from the participants yeah have you seen any uh, i think yeah, already yeah. one or two oh, yeah, yeah, this... sir one question is now uh, i will uh, here how do i identify different cloud condensation nucleus present in the cloud into its formation identify the cloud uh, this one that has to come through again uh, your different chemical analysis you collect the sample and then you have to do the because in cloud sampling when you take the aircraft they to they take the uh, this one uh, instruments and then try to do also do the uh, sampling in the air and then try to get the different chemicals which are present or you bring the filters and then you sample it in the uh, lab through the various uh, chemical characterization techniques and then you find out the samples which are there right sir thank you sir one interesting question uh, and it is a popular topic nowadays how artificial rain is produced and how safe is for the agriculture the artificial rain is either you do it through the um, uh, first is either enhancing the rainfall or enhancing or uh, 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 suppressing the hail now hail suppression is usually done through by sending in the silver iodide spraying the uh, super cooled liquid water region through by silver iodide particles which is normally mobile radars are used to uh, because they work con in conjunction with mobile radar and mobile rocket launchers so you need rockets to launch into the cloud so hail suppression you from the mobile radars uh, you find out regions of super cool droplets and then you try to send in uh, uh, rockets having silver iodide in it so that it is sprayed in the cloud and or you can fly in uh, so for precipitation enhancement for the warm clouds which is clouds which is not cross the freezing level you do hygroscopic seeding seeding is basically you try to provide bigger aerosol particles or bigger ccn which are uh, not available at those heights so that when on the bigger ccn when the nucleation is happening bigger drops are formed so the smaller drops will evaporate because the vapor pressure because due to the difference in vapor pressure smaller drops can evaporate provide you the vapor and the bigger drops can uh, begin to grow by condensation and if you have got a, a, a that is a polydispersed kind of spectrum which are because different sizes of aerosol spectrum you get ccn spectrum you give so sizes of drops which are forming are different so you can enhance the collision coalescence mechanism and thus uh, enhance your precipitation process so these are the basic techniques which are uh, again from ground based also people can do it but ground based again the success rate Uh, maybe less because it has to be taken up in the when you are burning the ccn because ccn is usually it is burned flares are burned so flare if you are burning from the uh, ground it has to go up again in the convection process so instead what they do is they go they fly the aircraft and uh, they uh, look they fire the flare at the updraft region below the cloud base so cloud base seeding is usually done and if the cloud is crossed above the freezing level then the aircraft can fly above the freezing level and from there also they can drop cartridges which is containing these uh, nuclei so that while the cartridge is falling the nuclei are released especially it is done with the silver iodide uh, this one over the cloud top you fly and then you drop cartridges uh, into the cloud and as the cloud is falling through the cloud the uh, nuclei are released and your uh, ice crystals can start forming so that is these are the different mechanisms through which uh, precipitation enhancement uh, artificial weather modification or artificial precipitation enhancement or artificial hail suppression can do that thank you sir you nicely explained sir uh, one very fundamental questions asked by igo chuku eji digo bo i think uh, he uh, he or she wants to know how do you capture or collect the cloud sample for analysis oh cloud sample you have got uh, the, nowadays you have got the cloud imaging probes which can take the images of the 
cloud particles in the cloud. Okay, these are again uh, uh, cameras are there and uh, laser beams are there. So they they have got nowadays very advanced uh, imagers are available. You can uh, when you can they are fitted onto the aircraft wings. So as it is flying through the clouds, the images can be captured. In the earlier days, uh, like when even now in the lab, what we do is we we have a technique which is called as a replication technique. In the earlier days, it used to be the replication technique, which is they use a mixture of a, 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 two a chemical, two chemicals, which are which is a foam bar. It is its uh, its popular name is foam bar. It is polyvinyl acetal resin, which is a kind kind of a, a, it's a kind of a plastic kind of resin that you mix it with chloroform in certain proportion. And then they used to have films which used to go out from the aircraft. And they, when the film is going out from the aircraft, it used to be coated. And all these ice crystals would uh, impact on it and uh, they, they would be brought, rolled back after warming it. And when it is warmed, the crystals would vapor, the water would evaporate, leaving you the fine impression of the crystal. Even so, whatever images I have shown you from my lab, it is from that foam war replication technique. Because this is this pombar is a uh, chemical which is used for uh, electron microscopy. Up to the microscopic level, you can get the imprints. So if you look at these uh, pictures which I have uh, shown from my lab, they are all collected on pombar, pombar coated slides. These are all pombar coated slides. This is again from my Manchester work, University of Manchester work in 1989. These, 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 if you're seeing, these are all collected on the in on the firmware coated slides. Replication technique. You can keep your slides for years together. You can bring it out because that is a replication technique which we uh, we are trained to do it. And so same techniques used to be used in the aircraft in the initial stages when they used to collect these uh, crystals. And now, of course, the imagers are available and through the imagers, they can uh, uh, very easily photograph them. So you can see all the fine impressions which are there. It is all up to the molecular level you can uh, see. Very fine impressions in the crystal. You can see these crystals. See all the inside, how very clearly it has formed, you can see. That's a really very excellent and very inspiring. Sir, uh, our session moderator, uh, TV Lakshmi Kumar, wished to know what could be the thrust or drive topics in cloud physics to a study as research? What could be the... I missed that point. What could be? What could, what could be the uh, thrust? T S R U S T. Or what is research? Thrust is uh, see, I, I space is where now the whole uh, is lot of uh, work is uh, going on because especially for ice nuclei, biological ice nuclei, then even on the black carbon ice nucleation process. So that is one, the, the, the gray area, the most gray area is ice process. When you come to the microphysics part of the clouds. And then of course the modeling and the ice multiplication process. The different ice multiplication process which I have listed. So these are the two gray areas which are still got to be, a uh, lot of field campaigns have to be done. So a lot of field campaigns are in uh, progress because I saw that is now this uh, ETH is also through MOES. They have uh, their projects are uh, taken up for uh, ice nuclear measurement over the Himalayan regions. And then I have my students who did PhD with me and who are looking at the Amazon region now as, as postdoctoral fellows in Sweden. So that is the most gray area because aircraft measurements are very few. Mostly that is, I said, that is, that's why we are sitting on the mountain tops. But the mountain tops, we are going only up to about two kilometers. So that is the most gray area. They're really nice. Uh, 
Dr. Tegi, sir, you wish to say something? Uh, no, it's um, very, very, it covers all the aspects. Just one point, Professor Prajit Kumar. How about the cloud observations by the radars? Uh, now we have a different frequency of radars, also the uh, dual pole. So does uh, these inputs help in uh, study of clouds and um, no no they would they wouldn't uh, they, they can come to the precipitation stage from your okay. uh, whatever and the particles are formed from that point onwards you can uh, lo look at it but not the uh, the microphysics when before the particles have actually started forming okay thank you Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. So, sir, uh, already all most of the questions are uh, covered. Still, I have seen one. Uh, how lightning occurs? And same person, uh, Mr. Abhishek Dhir, uh, want to know. Lectures are, uh, all the lectures are very outstanding. Please recommend me some books for atmospheric physics, which cover all, our, all the lectures. Uh, he wish to know some reference books. I am already giving it at the end of my lecture. Yeah, right, sir. Valles book you can take. Valles, ah, Valles, Valles and Orbs, Cloud Physics by Rogers. I am already suggesting the books, and some review articles also I have suggested. Now, lightning, I will I will be taking it up in the next in next lecture. So I will not answer that question. Yes, sir. It will be in the next day. Yeah. yeah thank you, Mohan, uh, for. Uh, Connecting this question also session. Yeah, it's almost so on behalf of uh, Sama and Sarah, yeah, I thank uh, Professor Parikh Kumar sir for giving an excellent talk on precipitation mechanisms. And I also thank other panelists, uh, uh, President uh, Sama, uh, Professor Ravi Majid Tyagi sir, Sama Secretary. Mohan Kumar Das and Dr. Rohini for acting as a panelist and I also thank the participants for their uh, patient hearing and uh, made the live interview very nicely. So I thank uh, all the participants who, who attended this lecture. So next week we are going to have a lecture on 24th, uh, not on Saturday. Again, we will have a we'll have 16th lecture of the entire live uh, entire this uh, lecture series that will be on the atmospheric electricity. I request everyone to attend that lecture uh, next Monday, that is on 24th April, same time, 3 p.m. IST, 9.30 a.m. UTC. I request everyone to attend that lecture also. So 29th, as I mentioned in the earlier, so, so Mr. mentioned earlier, we will have, a, we will conduct the evaluation test. Uh, uh, the information uh, we will be sending you in a week time everyone for attending this uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, no, it is ended. Yeah. Sorry, you can leave the meeting. Okay. Yeah, I ended, ended. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. You know, I have to. Okay, see you on next Monday. Thank you. Okay, okay sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank sir. you, Samesh. Is not there, I think. Mohan. Thank you, sir. Roini and, of course, uh, Lakshmi. Thank you so much. Good day. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Uh, Mohan, how is your eyes? Better? Take care. Hey, yes, sir. It is uh, almost recovered. So I am also giving some concentration on the daily works. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir.